Um, for our next talk at 2 o'clock, we've got Adam Grossman from Block 6 Analytics. Adam is the CEO and founder of the sports sponsorship technology and analytics firm, Block 6 Analytics, whose clients include the Dallas Cowboys, Cleveland Browns, Philadelphia 76ers, Pepsi, Gatorade, and Comcast Sportsnet. In addition, he's a lecturer for Northwestern University's Masters of Sports Administration, where he has developed two classes and teaches classes focused on developing and communicating strategic insights through data. Adam is the, also the co-author of the Sports Strategist, Developing Leaders for a High-Performance Industry, the featured book at the 2015 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. He has written for Forbes, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, and Comcast Sportsnet Chicago, and has been featured as an industry expert on CNN Marketplace, SB Nation Radio, and the Post Game. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome me, Adam Grossman. Thank you. I, uh, one other thing, uh, I also have like a weird back neck issue, so if you see me going like this, throughout just that's why. Um, so uh, what we're really going to talk about today is actually something I developed, uh, I don't know, I assume most of you here are familiar with the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. Uh, the original impetus for what we're going to talk about, uh, which is our revenue above replacement model, which is really focused on uh, the holistic value of players in sports in particular. You know, obviously a lot of these presentations here have been mostly focused on the on-field, on-court, on-ice piece. Uh, what we, my company really focuses on is on the business side of sports. You know, we've talked a lot about sponsorship, but really focused on asset valuation in sports and how can we leverage technology, data, and analytics. Um, probably for some of you in here, I'll lead off with the most important element, which is we are uh, hiring people for a uh, role in our company. It's a, a junior data scientist role, so if you're interested in that, let me know because um, we are looking to hire somebody. So I figured I'd get that out of the way early so that maybe you pay more attention. Uh, but the, uh, so the, the idea behind this, it, it really came from, you know, uh, Scott mentioned our book. So I was thinking of a way, so how could we demonstrate concepts from the book and apply it to sports that would, uh, and the past uh, presenter said, you know, What's a way we can get people to resonate with some of these concepts? Like, what's a really, what, what would people be interested about? Unfortunately, that's not always sports sponsorship, but it is when you're talking about how valuable are specific players to specific teams, that does seem to have more resonance. So, we built out this model originally just as a, you know, if you read the book, The Sports Strategist, and you applied some of the concepts from the book, this is something that you could derive. What we found is that there was an appetite for this within the sports industry. Um, not just for uh, teams, leagues, uh, and owners, uh, and players unions, but also the agents themselves. Um, there does seem to be, for whatever reason, not that many people who look at the business side of sports when it comes to player valuations and contract negotiations, and that's uh, one of the things, areas where we've been able to gain a little bit of traction. So. Uh, this is, so just to go over it uh, in terms of in a little more detail. So sports, as you guys know, um, is, you know, sports do operate as a business. They do have specific revenue streams. Those revenue streams are not always dependent on winning. What we did is we did a statistical analysis, mostly regression analysis, to determine is there a statistically significant impact on win percentage on overall revenue generation. Uh, when you talk about overall revenue generation, we'll talk about this in more detail in the presentation, but typically what we're talking about is in venue, and that's primarily, we group that with ticket sales, parking, concessions, those types of things. Uh, media revenue, uh, we're talking about football, you know, we, have, uh, we work with a couple different football teams. Obviously the national media rights deals are the biggest ones from that perspective, but also local media rights deals. Those are the primary things uh, we're looking at from a media perspective. Um, there are uh, uh, you know, uh, sponsorship, obviously, that's where we spend a lot of time, events, merchandise. And the biggest one uh, for a lot of teams is you know, a form of revenue sharing that doesn't always exist in every sports league, but particularly major professional sports leagues, partic particularly in the United States. So what we have to figure out is if those, all of those different revenue streams are potentially impacted by winning. And we typically do find that all of those revenue uh, streams are impacted by winning. So in order to, to analyze a player's overall value to a team, we do have to determine what is their actual contribution to winning. Uh, it's interesting about the pro football focus. You guys might have I see presenters in the back. Um, we actually did have to come up. We hadn't found a uh, on-field analytic that we really thought was the best outside of pro football focus in terms of how do you evaluate all these different players to determine what their impact is on the field. So we actually did create an on-field metric 
it is definitely not as robust as what probably what was just described, uh, but it is basically the idea behind that, and I'm happy to talk more about that as well if we have time at the end of the presentation, but we don't typically focus on the on-field side, right? We wanted to create this metric really for the business side of sports. So that's really our area of focus. So typically what we use on from the on-field perspective is whatever the most commonly used advanced analytic is in the sport. So for baseball, we use wind above replacement. Uh, for basketball, uh, we use a version of player efficiency rating. Um, and for football, like I said, we have to devise our own. But typically, we want to use a common language for the on-field side, where we really want to add value is on the off-field side. So that's really the question that we're asking, right? What is the actual player's holistic value to a team? If you think about it from a business context, you wouldn't necessarily value employees based on only one thing they could do, right? The idea is from a, if you're saying, how much should I pay this employee in a salary? Well, in theory, the employee should have some impact on, re on increasing revenue or decreasing costs. There's only two ways in the world to increase revenue. Either increase the volume of goods sold or you increase the price of those goods. Now there's a million different ways that you can do that and businesses spend a lot of time uh, figuring that out. But that's what we need to, to think about is what, how do players impact the volume of tickets sold, the volume of sponsors sold, how do they impact television ratings? And the most important part of this is, and this comes up, you know, one of the things that, again, is good that you guys, uh, a lot of you I think probably saw the Pro Football Focus presentation, is like how do you actually identify the individual performance of these players, either from an on-field perspective or from an off-field perspective. So that's what we spent a lot of time figuring out, is how do we figure this out? And then we do try to baseline, originally actually the conception was to baseline it against the replacement level player or some iteration of that. Uh, what we found is that most of our customers and people who think about this actually don't really care that much about it from like, how does this player compare to the replacement level value that's being generated for a team? So we're not really gonna focus it on that much. We have kept the name uh, revenue above replacement because we think it resonates with people, uh, the few people I guess, you guys excluded, who would know about this, is, is that revenue above replacement does resonate well from a wins above replacement perspective. So this is, what is actually the R RAR? Uh, again, we talk about it, we really look at three factors, on-field, off-field, and what we call personal performance. So on-field is again, what is the individual player's impact on winning and how does impact on winning actually impact revenue streams. Off-field is the same thing, so once we identify the, the variance caused by winning in terms of revenue streams, then we look at off-field characteristics. And the third part of it is personal performance. This is more of like what you would think from a sponsorship, sort of a sponsorship perspective, but if you guys are familiar with like earned media is a good example. So a player ended up, you know, we, in the past presentation, we were, they were mentioning you know, social media as a channel where people were talking about these players. Well, the team is not paying for those people to talk about, uh, you know, when somebody, a player is being talked about in social media or a player's highlights are seen on ESPN, or if they, you know, uh, if you're talking about what are the Milwaukee Brewers or the Milwaukee Bucks doing on the local newscast, that is not something that's being paid for by the team. That is what's called earned media. So the, the players in and of themselves, while that's not indirectly, or that's not directly generating revenue for a team, that is indirectly generating revenue for a team. So that part, that advertising, sponsorship, earned media factor is another factor that we look into. Um, and all of those different pieces together create what's called the uh, revenue above replacement model. So we'll go into this in more detail, but this is an example of what the output would look like. And I don't know how many people are familiar with Marcus Stroman, but the idea here is we have what's called our partnership scoreboard platform. That the idea here is to display all of the results for all the different teams within the concept of this platform. And this again shows, the idea is to show what is the on-field, uh, the, on the off-field, and the uh, personal performance. The idea here is to make this as digestible as possible, particularly for people who don't have a quantitative uh, uh, background or don't have a quantitative approach. Typically our client is not somebody who has a very strong quantitative background. Uh, and we have to really be careful not to, they are, for lack of a better term, afraid of numbers or afraid of data. And part of the reason they haven't done this type of analysis, particularly if you're talking about agents, is they don't necessarily, A, they don't necessarily want to know the answer, but B, they're not even sure what the answer would mean or how it reflects. Um, there's a little bit of a tangent, but uh, one of our investors is David Falk, who is Michael Jordan's old agent. Um, he was talking to David Stern, the former commissioner of the NBA, uh, and he was basically saying, and there's a little bit of vulgar language, so if you're offended by this, I apologize, but uh, he was saying, you know, David, how did you figure out how these 
players were, well, first of all, David Stern, when I met him, he said, you're basically trying to ruin everything I did from 30 years of being a commissioner, which is actually telling me how much players are valued and how much these sponsors are valued. And I said, that is very flattering, but obviously I am not doing that. So uh, the second thing is, David Falk goes, you know, how did you, how did you guys think about valuing players and partners? And David Stern's response was, well, how did you figure out what the uh, deal for Michael Jordan should be with Coca-Cola, or with Gatorade? Um, and David Falk's response is, the same way you figured out the NBA's deal with Coca-Cola at the time, you reached down deep within your asshole and you put pulled out a mouth. <laughs> and that's how you did it, right? And, and that's basically what, I mean, David Stern did officially say that was what he did, but uh, he did not officially say anyway, The point is, that's kind of, it, it hasn't really evolved. There are definitely been advances, but by far the biggest advances in analytics have been on the on the field side. So what we're really trying to put into perspective, and I think we're just starting to get there, and a lot of teams, uh, the Cowboys being a good example, but there are a lot of teams that are starting to build up their business analytics capabilities. But if you guys are really looking for an area, particularly the students here, of an area to get in with, into potentially working with a team, that's definitely where uh, a lot of growth is starting to happen. So why I bring all this up is that this is what we're trying to figure out, right? What is the output? What are the insights we can give to teams, leagues, events, owners, and agents so that they understand the information that we're talking about? And we'll come back to this a bit at the, at the end of the presentation. I just wanted to kind of show what the end state looked like. Uh, the other thing is, you know, I, I know we have a very, relatively short amount of time. I do talk very fast, um, and I can talk a lot. So I think there is a break after this, so I'm happy to answer any questions that you would have. Uh, one of the things is, if you don't have get enough of me talking now, what we do send out is more video of me talking. So uh, I also, there's, uh, I teach two classes at Northwestern. Some of them are distance learning classes. Um, actually, Tom, who's here also, actually, he's teaching the class that I helped create it. I don't know if he still are, but he, he was at well, least. Yeah. Uh, but uh, he, um, and actually, would be doing a much better job than I would be doing anything. So, uh, the, so I, I, but two of the classes, um, that I developed uh, have these types of videos in them. So depending on which video you see, you'll see different versions of a bad haircut. This is one version. Of the I have another version of a bad haircut in the other video. Okay, so what does this actually mean? And I'll slow down a little bit here so we can talk about a little more detail. So from determining the team's uh, ability to generate revenue and a player's individual contribution to winning, right? So the first thing we had to do, and this is an example, and again, this is just a stylized example, this could be on any sport, is to say, you know, one of the things we've talked about as an advanced uh, analytic is uh, adjusted win probability per game. You can think of that as, um, again, what is the player's uh, impact on uh, the impact on the winning percentage, all right? So the I know it's a little hard to see, but the first column is, what is the player's individual impact to winning, and then what is the team's individual impact on winning? One of the things that we have to do and what we have to control for is that stadiums of different sizes have obviously different levels of capacity. AT&T Stadium, poor Tom sitting in the front row, didn't know he was gonna be featured so much, but AT&T Stadium has over 100,000 people who can come. Right now, the Los Angeles uh, uh, Rams and Chargers are playing in a stadium that has, I think, 30 or 40,000 know, seat capacity. So to compare the number of tickets sold is not a fair comparison. So we try to adjust when we can to make sure we're making an apples to apples comparison and leveling the data sets uh, in that way. So we look at um, a capacity impact, we look at ratings impact, we look at, um, again, local media revenue if that's applicable, um, uh, national sponsorship and other team revenue and then local uh, revenue streams as well. Again, we have to look to see what is winning due to all of those different revenue streams to really understand the total financial impact uh, of a player. And I'll just, to show you what we did for football, and again, it's, I would go, if there's a doubt that you have, I would go with what Pro Football Focus did more than what we did in terms of on-field stuff, but that being said, that caveat put in there. Um, we actually, for our metric, you can see here, here's a list, not just the quarterbacks, we actually have ranked every single player in here. We also created a war type metric, it's called football war. I know, we're very creative with our names. Um, but the idea here is, and it's not actually very, it's not dissimilar from what the guys at Pro Football Focus did, and actually we, we are a subscriber to Pro Football Focus, we did integrate their ratings. The big difference that we have in ours, or one of them is, uh, and I don't know, I, I, I don't know if you guys account for this or not, I'm sure you do in some form, but the quantity of play, so it's not just the grade, but how much they actually played, so 
basically those are the two factors in our multi-factor regression analysis that we looked at to say what is that we also uh, before we did work with pro football focus we actually try to get data sets from you guys might be familiar with uh, football outsiders uh, actually there was I forgot what Brian Burke was the year Brian Burke had a, a, a sort of advanced analytic beforehand on football he stopped doing it which is why kind of threw us for a loop because all of our old data was based on the data that he created. So we then iterated to uh, Pro Football Focus, the obviously the far superior product. Uh, and then we let, we also aggregated some of our own information in there. So we could create our individual contributions to a team's winning percentage. The, what you see here is there's one column called player winning percentage and the one column called expected winning percentage. You were talking about before with Alex Smith in particular. And again, this is just for one season. We haven't done uh, multi-season yet, but Alex Smith is expected. So what we're looking at is based on that player's performance, what was the expected contribution to winning percentage and what actually occurred? So Tom Brady, similar to the pro football focus model, was our most valuable player from an on-field performance perspective. He's also the most valuable player off the field, not surprisingly. So th those combinations of factors made him the most valuable player in football uh, by his uh, him and Carson Wentz were by far the two most valuable players in our model uh, for the pr previous season. But the idea here is if there's a negative winning percentage, it's actually that player potentially would be more valuable on, a, on the average NFL team if he played for that team. So with Alex Smith, Alex Smith the Kansas, uh, on the Kansas City Chief contributed 17.15% of the overall wins. The expectation given his performance was actually 12.46. So he actually seemingly is more valuable to the Chiefs than he would be on the average team. So I wrote this blog post about it, and of course, the Redskins, which are the team of my youth and the team I grew up cheering for, immediately traded for him because he was more valuable for the Chiefs than he was potentially on the Redskins. So they clearly are having a huge influence on the decision-making process. But the larger point is, and actually Jimmy Garoppolo bringing up, you know, he actually, even in the relatively few games that he played, was almost was one of the top performing players in our model. So just how even for how little he played, it's clear he played at a way higher level than I think he would play at all, over the entire season. But if he were to play at that level over the entire season, he probably he might even surpass Brady in terms of his overall on-field performance. The reason I bring this up again, this is not typically what we do, but this is a version of how do you isolate individual performance. And that's really one of the key factors in this type of analysis is how do you figure out individual player performance? And how do you figure out what that individual player's performance is, not just on their team, but what could it be on a holistic value on all these other different teams? Because as you enter free agency, you know, you're not just looking at one team, you're looking at a bunch of different teams. So how do we actually how do we actually apply that in an off-field way? So we basically have identified um, three main factors that we've talked about a little bit, and really obviously this is the crux of the presentation is about star power, right? There are people who come to see players regardless if they're playing well or not. In our first iteration of the model uh, that we talked about, uh, Robert Griffin III, I guess, I think it was in the 2013 season, his first season was 2012, I think. In the 2013 season, he actually had a negative impact on revenue from an on-field perspective. His performance was below a replacement level quarterback, and he, I think it ended up being like negative $900,000 impact on on-field uh, component. But the off-field, it was something like 30 to $35 million, right? People were coming to watch games. They were watching uh, the Redskins because of, of Robert Griffin. They were interacting in social media because of Robert Griffin. They were uh, buying Robert Griffin's jersey. All of those things are happening. So they, people, even though Robert Griffin, unfortunately, was not playing well, he was still driving economic value to a team. That's what we really look at. So from our perspective, we really look at three main factors in terms of how do we isolate individual performance. Within those factors, there can be multiple components. The first one is jersey sales, right? How many, how much, how many jerseys are being purchased by uh, fans for that individual player, and how does that compare to the other players on that team? Uh, so you can apply that, the units, to all the different teams and say um, how valuable that player would be on those different teams. The second thing is we do have our own uh, what's called social sentiment analysis platform. It does analyze social media conversation. The first thing it does is it does look at sentiment, not just from a positive negative perspective, but from um, 
more of a, a valence perspective, we look at it, our system goes from negative 100% to positive 100%. Uh, and for, we use, if you guys are familiar with uh, Vader, uh, as a text, uh, a natural language processing platform, we use a version of that for our analysis platform. Uh, the reason I bring it up is one of the challenges that was brought up. I know not everybody was in the last presentation, but they were doing text-based analysis for soccer players. And one of the challenges is when you're doing sentiment is, as you rightfully pointed out, there are certain words that either, either have sarcasm or don't mean exactly what you think they're going to mean. One of the issues we found doing this type of analysis is we saw uh, KIA, which is, well, for many people would be the car company Kia, but in social media that stands for killed in action. So there was a lot of negative social sentiment around KIA because obviously if it's killed in action, it's much different than Kia or some version of that. So um, we, ha we, we also have to figure out ways to adjust for those types of things as well. But that's not, what's nice about that platform is it builds in a lot of those types of issues and what it's, or builds around those issues. What it's found, research has found is that humans are not really good at understanding sarcasm either, so particularly in text form, so that the sentiment of that platform slightly exceeds the performance of humans on uh, identifying uh, sentiment in text message posts, or in uh, social uh, sentiment analysis posts. So we use uh, that as our platform to one, understand the sentiment. Two, then we look at uh, engagement metrics to see what is the level of engagement. Uh, and we do that primarily across, across right now across Twitter and Facebook. Uh, we did it across Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Instagram changed its rules about privacy that has impacted what we're trying to do. So we've become more reliant on, on Twitter because it's easier to get the data. Um, that being said, a disproportionate amount of conversation about sports does happen on Twitter and Instagram. So even having Twitter is a probably a more reflective uh, of what the conversation is around an athlete. So we look at that athlete's individual accounts and then we, we can look at other accounts surrounding that athlete. Typically we don't just to keep it uh, a comparison uh, equal. So we look at those accounts to say, okay, what is the value being generated by those players um, for, uh, in their individual posts and then how does it compare to other players on the team? One of the interesting things that's come out is that the players themselves are actually can be more popular than the teams. So like the individual players have larger social media followings than the teams, um, which is potentially an underutilized asset from a sponsorship perspective because players can do things with teams. That being said, teams still have a gigantic platform and they still are able to, to really, particularly teams in the United States that are in the NFL and otherwise. But it is interesting because the individual athletes can be driving a lot of those conversation. Um, and the last thing we do look at is uh, in earned media analysis, like I said before, we have a data provider that helps us aggregate mentions of a specific player across multiple different channels, and then we can aggregate that information and then put that into the system as well. The main thing is there are different players will be have different values to different teams, and what we want to say, in a similar way from an on-field perspective, that's the case, that's the same from an off-field perspective. A player, you know, one of the players we did for this analysis was Giancarlo Stanton for baseball. He generated about $30 million in value for the Marlins, which is almost the exact value of his contract. But he would have, and he does have, more value for the Yankees than he does for the Marlins, because he could have a larger impact on those revenue streams that are being generated by the Yankees than he would for the Marlins. So that's just an example of, let's, let's take one player, see how he does in his current market, and then let's see how we can apply it to different markets using these factors. And then, again, in a similar way that we did it from the off-court perspective, we do it from an on-court perspective, so that we can say, okay, here are our three main things that we're looking at, on-court, off-field, off, you know, team off-field, personal off-field. So team off-field is just the direct revenue generated from a team. Personal off-field is that personal value that we talked about before to get the total revenue. Now what you can see here in this example is that some of these players are at 46 or 43 million. The salary caps and the structures of those leagues do not allow for those players to make that amount of money. This is what David Stern was talking about a little bit, is that you can see that there are some players who are more valuable than the maximum possible amount they can make from their contract. So we do also have a version of this where you can, I know it's a little hard to see, you actually can adjust for what was their cash flow, cash payment and also what would their payment be within the context of the salary cap. Because you have to adjust to say even if this player is the most valuable, you have to scale it to whatever their maximum value would be within the salary cap. That's been in each of the different leagues. 
This is an example of what we're talking about in terms of the earned media perspective. So you can see some of the different channels, some of the different sources of data, and some of the different things that we're looking at. Um, the idea here is, again, we want to see the holistic value of the player um, from, a, uh, earned and, uh, from an earned media perspective. So this is ultimately an example of what you want to see, right? You not only want to see the player in and of himself, but you want to see the player within the context of the rest of the players on his team. So in this case, Marcus Stroman actually had a, was a successful close to all-star level uh, pitcher for the Toronto Blue Jays, but he is one of the most active players on social media in baseball. Has a large engaged audience and also has a relatively high amount of jersey sales and a relatively high amount of earned media. All of that has contributed to him being really valuable to the Blue Jays. His actual contract right now is he's being the way that, again the way that baseball contracts work. He makes a little over three million dollars and he's generating over sixty-two million dollars in revenue. So this will show you why younger players are specifically in baseball because of the way that those contracts are structured, where you have to have six years of major league service at the moment before you can become a free agent. Players like Marcus Stroman, Bryce Harper are extremely valuable because they're going to be underpaid for the amount of value that they're given, and that is a big benefit for teams. Rightfully so, they should take advantage of that benefit. So um, that's, I know we're at the end of the time here, so um, I know that was a lot in a very short amount of time. Uh, the, the last thing I would say, and again, just purely for what my company does as an example, you know, we were talking about speed of analysis. One of the things we want to do in the future is integrate more of our machine learning uh, technology into this type of analysis. So this is an example from a World Cup game on the 18th. So you can see our machine is identifying the sign, the visa sign on the end. Um, the idea would be, one of the things we've also done is develop something called a jersey patch analysis for the NBA. So we, across targeted accounts, have valued all of the different jersey patches that existed. One of them, uh, one of the things that you can see here is we do have individual players. We do have individual players in, in this model. Um, and the idea here is that if we can aggregate the value, this is just another example and another way that uh, value is being created. The idea is if we can start to integrate all of these faster ways of aggregating, collecting, and analyzing data, then we can see <laughs> we can see the value that are being uh, created. And you can see Kyrie Irving just by himself generated 1.2 million dollars of the two million dollars of value in this analysis. Okay, that's it. So, happy to answer any questions that you have. Let me uh, say it's it's 2:30. Uh, you're free to ask Adam questions after this, but we do have a five-minute break schedule right now. We've got some snacks available in the legacy room. Next talk will be here in 2.35, but before we go, I'll round of applause for Adam.